In October 2007, the History Channel aired a documentary titled The Lost Book of Nostradamus, a collection of 80 watercolor images compiled as an illustrated codex. In one of those images, we are warned of an object that will wreak havoc on Earth and that it will come from the constellation Ophiuchus, the 13th sign of the zodiac. Be sure to remember that for future reference. Ophiuchus. This is because the Lost Book of Nostradamus is talking about the same object as Zachariah Sitchin wrote about in the Twelfth Planet, a planet known to the ancient Sumerians as Nibiru, the planet of crossing. But could there really be a connection between the ancient Sumerians and Nostradamus? And what about those crop circles that keep popping up? Are they warning us that in the near future, Every human on the face of the planet will see a terrible sight with their own eyes, one that cannot be dismissed as mere conjecture. And if so, is there proof that Nibiru not only exists, but that it is coming our way? Only if you implicitly trust our leaders to be honest with us. In 2008, a courageous whistleblower chose to come forward and he released images taken with the South Pole Telescope in January of that year. They clearly show that Sitchin's Nibiru is actually a planet in orbit around a brown dwarf sun, a companion to our own soul. Ergo, what's coming our way is a mini-constellation that we at Yauza.com call the Planet X system. The outermost orbital of that system is Nibiru, the planet of crossing, and it has been steadily observed from three different surveillance cameras in Costa Rica since 2010. But until the day comes that people are standing out on the street with friends and neighbors and pointing up at the sky and saying things like, oh boy, that's going to leave a mark. This is going to be an object of dismissal. It should be an object of concern because as you're going to see in this program, Nibiru is nearing. Before we present our findings, I want to address an issue that is of concern to those of you who have been following my work over the years, namely the attacks on me by self-appointed debunkers, cynics, and trolls that none of my predictions for December 21, 2012 have come to pass. Well, in fact, I only made one prediction, and we're going to talk about that later on. But right now, let's compare what the debunkers are saying against what's in my published works beginning with Planet X Forecast and 2012 Survival Guide. In our book, Planet X Forecast and 2012 Survival Guide, we used a forecast scenario to help illustrate basic astronomy concepts relevant to the discussion of Planet X. Our goal was to answer questions we often receive from folks who visit our website at yauza.com. A basic concept, such as the ecliptic, is important because the Earth is tilted on its axis relative to the ecliptic. Another critical concept is that of elliptical orbits. This is because the Planet X system is in a comet-like, 
long period elliptical orbit around Sol. Therefore, an understanding of the relationship between the ecliptic and elliptical orbits is necessary to understanding the catastrophic solar interactions that will occur during the flyby. So did we make a prediction in this book as the debunkers claim? For the record, we never made any predictions in the book. What we offered was a forecast to illustrate the concepts I just explained. And in fact, we clearly say in the book itself, this forecast is simply nothing more than that, a forecast. How close to the mark was it, given that Nibiru was first imaged by a Turrialba volcano surveillance camera in Costa Rica in February of 2010, you could say we were close enough for government work. So what about those self-appointed debunkers, cranks, trolls, and all their lies? The real truth is that most attacks are planted by teams of paid disinformationalists, folks with the temperaments of petty retail clerks, and they do what they do for the elites to pay their child support. And I give thanks that this is the worst I get of it, because I'd really be worried if I were a professional astronomer. It's a third rail topic for these folks because a lot of them die mysterious, violent, and sudden deaths. And if I were a professional astronomer, I would be seriously worried about that. So now, let's move forward to a discussion of my next published work, Crossing the Cusp. In my book, Crossing the Cusp, Surviving the Edgar Cayce Pole Shift, I offer an analysis of the predictions made by a crop circle that appeared in Avebury, England in 2008. My goal in using this very unique asymmetrical crop circle was to illustrate a possible causality for a pole shift event. Interestingly enough, this crop circle also referenced the constellation of Ophiuchus, and what I found interesting about it was that the formation appeared in two parts just days apart. Equally amazing is that both parts fit together with surgical precision, resulting in a massive formation that was nearly the size of four soccer fields. So what about my analysis of the Avebury crop circle? Although the first surveillance camera at Turrialba failed during an eruption event in early 2012, the images you now see came from the newer second camera we first began monitoring on January 5th of 2013. As to my analysis of the Avebury crop circle, it was nothing more than that, an analysis. But given that Nibiru was once again being imaged in January 2013, I think it is fair to say that once again we were close enough for government work. So, what about that one prediction that I made for December 21, 2012? Truth be known that on August 17th of 2012, I did in fact make a December 21, 2012 prediction while being interviewed by National Geographic. As we were preparing for the interview, the producer gave me a heads up that he would be asking the question and to be prepared. During the interview, he asked, Marshall, what exactly will you be doing on December 21, 2012? My prediction was that I would get up that morning and do what I do every morning, make my coffee. And sure enough, on December 21, 2012, I woke up and made coffee. And that was no lightweight prediction because... I take my coffee very seriously. So... For December 21, 2012, I'm one for one. But you know, during that interview with National Geographic, I also shared my thoughts on a couple of other things. And while I did not see a clear correlation between Planet X and Mayan prophecy, I do see a very clear correlation between Planet X and Hopi prophecy. I grew up in Phoenix in the 1960s, where I developed a genuine respect for the Hopi and their folklore. Therefore, I take a serious view of their Blue Kachina prophecy, 
which predicts the appearance of a blue harbinger object followed by the appearance of a red object, which will cause a cataclysm. Hopi prophecy is so important to me that on April 20th in 2013, we posted a video titled Blue Kachina and Its Moon. My reason was that I initially named Nibiru as Blue Bonnet. This was because the object reminded me of the blue bonnet flowers I used to see in Texas in April and May. They are beautiful things to behold. Nonetheless, the operative word here is blue, and in retrospect, the one thing I wish I had included in that video would have been an explanation of something astronomers call blue shift and red shift. Blue shift occurs when an object is coming towards you because the light waves are compressed. Conversely, when an object is going away from you, it appears reddish because the light waves become elongated. Ergo, the blue kachina and the red kachina spoken of in this Hopi blue kachina prophecy are in fact one in the same. Furthermore, this object has been imaged by three completely different camera systems at Turrialba, and this dates back to 2010, mind you. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the most recent observations since our last program in this series, Planet X 101, Who, What, Why, Where, When, and How. A courageous group of very talented amateur astronomers who call themselves the Zero Zero Skyview team have been tracking Nemesis and its orbitals for a few years now. And it's really sad to see how much they get attacked and from so many different angles. As the old saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished. On October 21, 2013, the Zero Zero Skyview team posted a YouTube video titled, Now Seen in the Western Sky. In this video, they challenged amateur astronomers to make their own observations of Nemesis. All that was needed for the observation was a basic telescope costing a few hundred dollars, and they made the instructions very simple for the benefit of newbies. They did this by using easily recognizable references to Neptune and Arcturus. They also showed us how the object is moving through the sky and where they had last observed it. What you see here is what they observed and they provided this image so newbies could recognize what they were looking at. And here's an enhanced close-up. Admittedly, it is not a delightful viewing experience like the rings of Saturn or finding the moons of Jupiter. Rather, an observation like this has an ominous feel to it, as it should, because it is a brown dwarf star, a sister companion to our own soul. So, let's take a close look at it. Nemesis is a brown dwarf star. It was only in the 1960s that they were first theorized to exist, and at that time they were called black dwarfs. Unlike our soul, a brown dwarf lacks the mass to sustain a nuclear furnace, so they are by nature very dim and difficult for astronomers to observe. Also, they can be surrounded by a dusk disk, as shown in this artist's illustration, which makes them even more difficult to observe because Nemesis has a dust disk. Let's take another look at it. If we were to imagine that we are floating in space with Nemesis before us, it would probably look somewhat like this. It would be dark and surrounded by an ever-shifting dust disk that would only make it even more difficult to observe. It is why Chilean astronomer Carlos Ferrada, the man to theorize about the existence of Nemesis, called it the black star. He called it black for a good reason. The part of the light spectrum that is visible to the human eye is a narrow band between the 400 to 700 nanometers range. 
This is why the Planet X system will need to be much closer to our Sun before it is visible everywhere on the planet. In the meantime, when observed in the infrared spectrum, a brown dwarf-like nemesis will stand out like a sore thumb. Thanks to another courageous whistleblower known only to us as Nibiru Shock 2012, do we have infrared observations of both Nemesis and the entire Planet X system taken in January 2008 with the South Pole Telescope. Called the SPT, it is located at the Edmondson Scott South Pole Station in Antarctica. As you can see in this series of images, we're not looking at a single object, but rather a brown dwarf companion to our own sun with its own planets and moons, which is why we call this mini constellation the Planet X system. Also of note in 2008, another whistleblower known as DNIR 4808N1 leaked an observation of Nemesis made with the SPT in May of that year. When you put them side by side, it's clear that we have not one, but two observations of the same object taken months apart. In other words, clear confirmation. I personally witnessed how both of these YouTube channels came under professional attack. This was a takedown, a suppression, pure, plain, and simple. But, you know what? There's still the gift that keeps on giving. Ha ha ha. So with that, let's take a look at the object I initially dubbed Blue Bonnet. And we've been observing that from the surveillance cameras at Turrialba. And it happens to be the outermost orbital of the Planet X system. This image from the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica was captured with the third camera system installed there, which in a word is simply pathetic. Nonetheless, if you look closely, you'll see our object of interest. I first dubbed it Blue Bonnet, but it actually happens to be the planet Nibiru, which orbits Nemesis, the brown dwarf observed by the Zero Zero Skyview team in October of last year. There is a lot of confusion about Nibiru out there, because most people do not understand that Nibiru, also known as Planet X, Hercobolus, Red Planet, Destroyer, Frightener, and other names, is the outermost orbital of Nemesis. Therefore, Nemesis and Nibiru are part of what we refer to as the Planet X system, a mini constellation in orbit around our own sun, Sol. Now, okay, some of you might be saying, hey, next time I'm at an altitude of 13,000 feet on top of a volcano, tell me which way to look. In the meantime, can we see it here in the United States? Well, if you look up, you can. One man did. His name is Richard Bowlerup, and he's from North Carolina. Richard is a professional contractor and spends most of his days outside. And he does something that 99.99% of everyone else in America fails to do every day. He looks up at the sky. You know, it's a funny thing to say, but the next time you walk through an airport departure lounge, take a moment to notice what I call the zombie shuffle. You'll see people looking at their slavetronics instead of looking at each other. As you do, notice how quiet the terminal can be. All you'll likely hear are the sounds of airport workers and the air conditioning system. Otherwise, everyone else is buried into their slavetronics and oblivious to the world around them. But not so for Richard Bowlerup. He looks up and now in his own words, he's going to share with us what he observed in the skies above Statesville, North Carolina. This is Marshall and I'm interviewing Richard Bowlerup of Statesville, North Carolina. Richard, thank you for stepping up to the plate. Thank you. Now, we're going to show two images here. And the first one we're talking about, you took on December 13th, 2013. Did you see this with your own two eyes? Oh, most definitely. Is that what prompted you to take the picture? Oh, no doubt about it. And you used a Samsung 13 megapixel smartphone? Yes, Samsung Note 3, actually. All right. At the moment you saw that blue object in the sky, what caught your attention? What made you look? Well, the first thing, I was uh, working on a roof, 
because I'm in construction, and I happened to, you know, take a break. You know, my back was hurting a little, and straighten myself out, and I looked up, and I noticed there was a, a, a secondary light in the sky besides our sun, mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. that really attracted me because I've heard a lot about, you know, Planet X, Wormwood, whatever you want to call it, and then I, I looked, and I seen that, and I started snapping photos. I know you sent us several of those, and how long did it remain persistent in the sky to the naked eye? Actually, it was on and off to the naked eye for at least, I would say, 30 minutes as the uh, chemtrails were covering and uncovering these objects in the sky. And we can see chemtrails in the picture. So was the spraying heavy that day? Oh, yes. They were trying desperately to cover it, uh, my opinion. Okay. Now, let me go forward in time to your second photo taken on January 8th. 2014. What were you doing that day? Were you in the same area when you took that picture in Statesville, North Carolina? No, I wasn't in the same area, but I was still in Statesville. But I went to Walmart to pick up a few things. And I, I looked, I'm always looking at the sky, especially after noticing those first pictures that I took. Mm-hmm. And uh, I noticed another glow in the sky next to our sun to the right, right. around 3 o'clock to our sun. And I noticed another little blue dot in the sky, so I started taking pictures. Another blue object. You saw this with your own eyes first, and then you took the picture using the Samsung smartphone, correct? No doubt about it. All right. How long did this blue object persist in the sky that you were able to observe it that day? Well, I was snapping pictures that day for about five minutes, actually. Mm Mm-hmm. Approximately, it could be give or take a minute. And once I got my pictures, I was just like happy with them, so I left. So I couldn't give you exact, you know, how long it was in the sky. It wasn't for long because they're always hustling up to cover it up. Obviously. Well, Richard, thank you so much. I really appreciate you submitting this report to Yaza.com. All right, and I thank you. It's been a pleasure. During this interview with Richard, he noted that chemtrail spraying makes it very difficult for him to see the object. Well, let's take a look at chemtrail spraying and see how it does affect our ability to observe the skies. On February 22, 2014, YouTuber Jerry Leonard 999 posted chemtrail time-lapse Charlotte skyline. In the comments, he posted a chilling note. The city was engulfed in a chemical fog throughout the day. So what did this fog look like and how does it affect our ability to observe the sky? Personally speaking, I often see chemtrails just like this. So let's watch Jerry's video as they pass in front of the sun. Now you've got to ask yourself, could condensation be this persistent? But likewise, Can it distort our view of the sun as much as these chemtrails are doing? And is this just a one-day fluke? No. This is because the following day, Jerry Leonard 999 posted another video titled Chemtrail Time Lapse, Charlotte Skyline at Sunrise. In the comments he says, On this day the planes started at dawn and filled the sky with sun-blocking chemicals. It leaves you remembering that great line from The Wizard of Oz. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. That being said, what I find most impressive about this video is that it shows a clear spray pattern in the sky. What's also important to note about these chemtrail tankers is that they have their own air traffic control system. Pilots in both commercial airliners and military jets cannot detect their presence because they do not squawk on any transponder frequencies used by commercial and military pilots. And now let's take a closer look at this same image to see how an object in the sky can be easily masked from view by these chemtrails. Watch how the object truly does disappear from view. So now the question is, who is telling you the truth? My job in the U.S. Air Force was working in bioenvironmental engineering. 
So what bioenvironmental engineering is in the Air Force is equivalent to that of the OSHA and the EPA, if you're familiar with that. The biggest hurdle that we have is disinformation sites. I never say them, but I'm going to today so that you know if anyone ever gives these to you as a reference to debunk you, it's Metabunk and Contrail Science. Those are two websites that are ran by a government shill named Mick West. And he is a computer gaming programmer who tries to tell you about persistent contrails. So somebody who isn't even credentialed in chemistry or physics or ecology, none of that, is trying to tell you that you're crazy. For those of you who want to attempt your own daylight observations, remember, it's an object near the sun, so you're only going to see it just before sunset or sunrise. Now, another thing is, if you've got a good smartphone, please take a picture and send us the original file from the phone. It's going to have information in there that we need. But above all else, look up. You'd be surprised how few people actually do that these days. So, now that we have all of our most current observations of Nemesis and Nibiru, let's see where we find them in the sky. I wish I had a dollar for every time I hear a self-appointed debunker say if amateur astronomers were observing this they'd be reporting it. Well they are observing and they are reporting. Not that the debunkers are following that. They're just busy with their agenda. And last year in October the Skyview team posted a challenge video to these people. We're going to show you what happened as we begin our analysis. When the Zero Zero Skyview team posted their YouTube video, now seen in the western sky on October 21, 2013, it was a challenge to the cynics. Here's our object, and here's where you can find it in the night sky to see it for yourself. And if the cynics had looked, this is what they would have seen. But there never was time for that because the channel came under intense attack and within 24 hours the video disappeared and here is what came in its place. On February 2, 2014, Yowza.com published its expose of the disinformation attack on this video within hours after the 00 Skyview team posted their video an attack video was created by an anonymous production group calling themselves Nutcracker. It was then posted on the Cosmophobia YouTube channel and from there was reposted by Daza the cameraman, who could be a useful idiot or an operative. Either way, it doesn't matter, as it all happened within a day, and in our article, we documented this attack on a blow-by-blow -blow basis. So what was the public response? Most people did not care, and so the disinformation prevailed. Nonetheless, the Zero Zero Skyview team's October observation of Nemesis stands on record as a valid observation because only legitimate observations are suppressed in this manner. According to the Zero Zero Skyview team, they observed this object on October 2013, which they show tracking from the constellation Aquila to the constellation Ophiuchus where, interestingly enough, the Lost Book of Nostradamus tells us to look, assuming we're curious enough about where this beast is coming from. So with that, let's plot it on our yowza.com observation star map. This way, you'll be able to see where all of these observations appear within the same exact piece of sky. Please note, we've made every effort to plot these observations as precisely as possible but do please allow for a small margin of error. So, let's go. First off, here's the spot where the Zero Zero Skyview team observed Nemesis on October 21, 2013. 
Then on December 13, 2013, Richard Bolorup of Statesville, North Carolina, personally observed and captured this image of Nibiru. We checked Richard's observation against Stellarium to verify that it was not a cataloged object, such as Venus, and that it was in the proper field of view. It was not a cataloged object, and it was in the proper field of view. This placed Richard's first Nibiru observation in or near the constellation of Ephucus. Given that Nibiru is the outermost orbital of the Planet X system, this gives you a good idea of how large this mini constellation is. Next up is our January 23, 2014 observation of Nibiru with the third camera system installed on the Turrialba volcano in Costa Rica. We checked this Turrialba observation with Stellarium to verify that it was not a cataloged object such as Venus and that it was in the proper field of view. It was not a cataloged object and it was in the proper field of view. With this observation of Nibiru, we find it close to the center of the constellation Ophiuchus. Interestingly enough, Richard Bullerup's January 8, 2014 observation of Nibiru was made a few weeks earlier, and it put Nibiru very near the same spot where we found it with the January 23rd observation from Turrialba. We also checked Richard's second observation with Stellarium to verify that it was not a cataloged object such as Venus and that it was in the proper field of view. It was not a cataloged object and it was in the proper field of view. It is interesting to see the close proximity of Nibiru in these two different observations in January of this year, one from Turrialba and the other from North Carolina. And our last observation in this data set was of Nibiru on February 12, 2014 from Turrialba. We checked this second Turrialba observation with Stellarium to verify that it was not a cataloged object such as Venus and that it was in the proper field of view. It was not a cataloged object and it was in the proper field of view. With this observation placement, Please keep in mind to allow for a small margin of error. Nonetheless, what we're seeing here is the suggestion of an elliptical orbit path. It is also important to note that the placements on this observation sky map do not take into account how these objects are moving through the sky over time and in relationship to each other. That being said, what we clearly have now are three different observations from three different credible sources. So with this in mind, let's tackle the 800-pound gorilla. In other words, Nibiru is nearing. I published my first Planet X article in January 2002, and I've learned a few things along the way. First off, the closer something comes to the truth, the faster it disappears. And second, well, some things just can't disappear all that easily, and so they find ways to hide them in plain sight. Which brings me to Turrialba and this object I initially dubbed Blue Bonnet, which is in fact Nibiru. On February 11, 2013, we published our first video on Nibiru titled Object of Interest as Seen from the Turrialba Volcano. The cameras on this volcano are mounted at 11,000 feet above sea level and look out to the southwest with a magnificent view of the eastern Pacific Ocean. At 10 degrees north, there is very little chemtrail spraying, so the skies are clear. And as a matter of fact, at that latitude, there is no other place with such a perfect high-altitude view of the sky. Given that Turrialba is an active volcano, 
The purpose of these cameras is not to capture stunning sunrise photos for tourists. It's to let the folks living at the base of the volcano know if they need to bust a move. Consequently, the cameras take a real beating from the environment. The first camera to capture images of Nibiru was the standard definition camera oviscori. And we have these captures thanks to a diligent Chilean engineer by the name of Rodolfo Quesada. Here you see images of Nibiru captured in 2010 by Rodolfo. Even at this time, this object, I first dubbed Blue Bonnet, was rather bright. In early 2012, the first camera was toasted during an eruption and was replaced in December 2012 with the high-definition Oviscori Una camera system. Of the three camera systems, this second system was by far the best. As you can see in this series of captures, the quality was superb. Also, for those interested, objects close to the sun, such as Nibiru, can only be viewed just before sunrise or sunset. In our case, the optimal viewing time was between 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. local time. This second camera system was the cat's whiskers, and we loved it. But in May 2013, Turrialba went on the rampage again, and the guacamole hit the fan. Sayonara, camera system number two and we were in the dark until July 2013. The feed came back with a third camera system, and it is unquestionably the worst of all three, and it was gifted to Costa Rica by our own government. Excuse me, but aren't we the nation that spies on everyone with amazing resolution and clarity? So why did our government give Costa Rica a pathetic camera system with the lowest imaginable resolution. Not only that, this third camera system was installed with a noticeable tilt and a zoomed out field of view. The result was that we could not acquire any useful images of Nibiru for the remainder of 2013. However, in January 2014, even the tilt and zoom of this pathetic camera could not prevent us from seeing images of Nibiru once again. So with this in mind, we're going to do a head-on comparison of images for the months of January 2010, 2013, and 2014, each taken with a different camera system. And to level the playing field, we'll compensate the third camera's bizarre tilt and zoom so that there will be a consistent relationship between all three camera systems. Now, in order to adjust for tilt and zoom, we need to start with the camera 3 image, since that is the one that is intentionally configured to be misleading. This compensation begins by defining a common reference for all three cameras. That's simple. We've always used this small peak in the middle of the saddle at the mouth of the volcano, and so we'll use it here to compensate for all three camera system images. For camera 1, we're using an image acquired on January 2010. For camera 2, we're using an image acquired on January 2013. And for camera 3, we're going to use an image acquired on January 23, 2014. We'll start by using this January 23, 2014 image from camera 3, and here is the small peak in the saddle which will serve as our reference. This is what we'll use to adjust the images from cameras 1 and 2, so they are consistent for tilt and zoom with camera 3. Here we see the January 2010 image from camera 1 adjusted for the field of view for camera 3. And here we see the January 2013 image from camera 2 adjusted for the field of view for camera 3. So now that everything is on a level footing, we're ready to take a look at close-up images of Nibiru as it was imaged in 2010, 2013, and 2014 to see if there is any difference in size. Here we see our first image from the first camera in January 2010. 
Next is a close-up of Nibiru from Camera 2 in January 2013. And now for the big bada bing. Here we see our third image from Camera 3 taken in January of this year. All three close-ups are fully adjusted for zoom and tilt. Therefore, the evidence clearly shows that Nibiru has increased in size, despite the machinations of our government and the low-resolution camera it installed at Turrialba with a bizarre tilt and zoom. Further proof that Nibiru is nearing was presented in our previous program in this series, Planet X 101, Deep Impact. Based on our intensive analysis of the report data published by the American Meteor Society, we were able to show a clear upwards trend in the number of observed fireballs and bolides beginning in 2009 and going through to a projected trend date of January 2017. We also presented a comparison of multi-state observation events and huge events with 100 or more reports and what we saw was a slight slump in the first quarter of this year. One possible explanation for this is that Nemesis, the brown dwarf at the core of the Planet X system, has a dust disk. If we think of it like the rings of Saturn, this temporary slump in the first quarter of this year could simply be the result of Earth passing between the rings of the Nemesis dust disk. In this case, whatever comes next could be much worse. And given that Nibiru is nearing, as we have shown in this program, and that there's a sharp uptick in fireballs and bolides being observed, as noted in our previous program, Deep Impact, it's not long, folks, before we're going to be in deep kimchi. But you know what? I'm going to let you chew on that one on your own. And I'll leave it on that note. So, until the next time we meet, remember Marshall's motto. Destiny comes to those who listen and fate finds the rest. So learn what you can learn, do what you can do, and never, never, never give up hope. This is Marshall, and I'll catch you on the backside.